This isn't your first time in Ukraine. Uh, how do you feel about traveling here and uh, why do you travel here? Um, well, I'm always very happy to come back to Ukraine. Um, it's been a long time since I have been back, but coming back to Ukraine is always very special um, because this is where my father's from. And, uh, and so it's, it's really interesting to come back and see places and just to be here is something that's near and dear to me. Have you ever met here in Ukraine girls or young women who are, you know, aspiring astronauts who would like to be an astronaut and asking you, you know, about the profession? Um, yes, the last time that we were here, um, we have had, I have had the opportunity to talk to, uh, to school children and, and to see, you know, the young girls, you know, get really interested and want to be astronauts. Um, you know, I tell them all that what you need to do is you need to study hard. You need to study hard and you need to learn because um, if you're not technically competent, then you're not going to stand a chance in getting selected because a lot of people want to be astronauts and they only pick a very few. And I know that it's that much harder here in the Ukraine because your space agency here in the Ukraine is not as large as NASA. So it is harder um, for a Ukrainian, but I have no doubt that sometime in the future um, Ukraine will select another astronaut, and I really do hope that they select a female astronaut. You've had, you know, you, you know, Yuk, um, has been the first astronaut, and then his backup um, was uh, Yaroslav Pustove. So, so hopefully the next one will be, you know, a female, and, and she'll have an opportunity to fly in space. But your way to, to NASA was also quite, quite long. You went to MIT, then you joined uh, the Navy, and um, you joined NASA in 1996, but you didn't go to space until 2006, which is almost 10 years. Yes. So how long does it really take to get prepared for your first spacewalk? And what do you really do during these years? So the preparation prior to me coming to NASA that's everything that makes up your um, application. And the minimum that's required from NASA is um, you have to have at least a bachelor's degree in a technical field. So that's four years in college. Um, realistically, I tell people you really need to have at least a master's degree, which is another two years in, of college. Um, not you necessarily, you know, pilot. Not necessarily pilot, no. Um, then the work experience comes important. Um, NASA wants to see what did you do with that education? How did you apply it? And did you apply it in a way that would prepare you for going into space? Um, so I joined the Navy because they paid for my college. And so when I went into the Navy, um, I became a diver. I was fixing ships, fixing ships underwater. And so that gave me the experience to be able to go to NASA and you know be able to do spacewalks because it is very similar to you know going out in open space is very similar to working underwater. How is it similar and what what did it really gave you you know what skills uh, maybe also some psychological also traits or preparation to go into outer space? Yeah. So it's similar in the sense that you have to so first off you have to have um, a lot of protective equipment and on your back on your back or or underwater it's the the helmet and you know a big wetsuit you have gloves because it's cold and um, and when we were diving we didn't have a lot of times under a ship you don't have tanks on your back you have an air hose that goes to the surface um, but because you have all this cumbersome equipment it limits your visibility you can't see all around because you got this helmet on like this and you it's harder to work because you're not standing on something you're not standing on a platform so when you have to do your work you you're forced to think about how am i going to move in doing this work and how can i get myself in a good position to be able to do the work properly and that's the same thing in space um, when you're out in space yeah you have a different type of suit on but you're not standing on a platform you're floating around and 
you have to figure out how is it that you're going to make yourself steady enough so you can do the tasks that you have to do. You cannot help yourself with yeah. your legs or anything. No, unless you're unless you happen to be on a on a platform, which we can which we do in space, and we have the same thing underwater. But but most of the time you are going to be free floating, and so because I already had those that experience and develop those work habits, um, that also played directly going into space. Um, also from my, my diving, I learned very easy that, uh, very early, that if I, as long as I had, you know, a helmet on or a regulator in my mouth, then I had plenty of air. And as long as I had air, okay, I was, <laughs> I was fine. Okay. <laughs> Life is good. <laughs> Um, and so you mm -hmm. get very comfortable being underwater, being upside down, being sideways, um, and that's the same thing in space. And what was the hardest while you were trained to become an astronaut? So the hardest part was the training for the spacewalks, uh, at least the hardest physically. Um, our spacewalks are six and a half hours long, and so our pool sessions would be six hours long. And so you're underwater for six hours in a big suit working. And that was just, that was just very physically tiring. Let's go back to your first flight. So yeah. you take off in a shuttle. It takes you around eight minutes or so yeah, to get to yeah. the orbit. Eight and, a half, eight and a half minutes. Eight and a half minutes. You're there. Your first thoughts, your first feelings at that moment. The, the first thought of, at liftoff, when you, when you feel that thrust from having those two rockets light and you just feel this tremendous um, acceleration and you just know that there's this tremendous amount of power um, trying to push us off the earth which is what it's doing and it's just it's amazing um, you know you're sitting in a seat not too much unlike a seat like this what were you thinking about so all I was just thinking about was wow I'm actually going to be going into space this is actually happening. I'm going into space. Um, and it's, it's eight and a half minutes long, and it just goes by um, very quickly. Very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, after two minutes, the two solid rocket boosters are, are expended. They're fully used up. And so they stop burning. So it, gets, it does get a little bit quieter and not as shaky, not as much vibration. You hear this, this bang, bang which is the pyrotechnics that separate them. And, uh, and so they bang, bang, they go away, and we continue on the main engines. And so the ride, like I said, gets much, much smoother. The last 30 seconds is when you, when you get the maximum um, Gs, the maximum force on you. You're sitting in your seat, and you're just being pushed back. Into your chest. Um, it feels like it's your chest, or it's it, your head, or it's everything. It, it's everything. Um, you just kind of felt, I just kind of felt heavy. Um, if I tried to lift my hand, it was just very heavy. Um, I've heard other astronauts um, describe it as, you know, like having an elephant sitting on your chest. Um, I didn't think it was that bad, but um, you, just, you, you, just feel, you just feel very, very heavy. And that's 30 seconds, and then at the end of 30 seconds, um, the main engine shut down, and everything just gets very quiet. If, uh, if there was anything loose in the cockpit, at that point, it, does, it will fly out. You said that you were trained also by veteran astronauts who used to tell you that when you go out into the open space, um, your fear that you might you know, fly away, drift away, is not really logical because you won't. And, yeah. and you need to work with the tip of your fingers. That's, that's, yeah. that's the work. Is it really so? By the time we went out, we had already been in space for three or four days. Um, so you, got, you started getting used to what it felt like to be in space and how to move around floating. When you go outside, it's still the same. The only difference is, is there, you're outside as opposed to being inside the cabin. So you're not, um, you do know that you're not gonna float away unless you push, okay? So you do have a safety tether. But in general, um, you know, you're just 
you just know that you don't want to rely on the safety. As I say, you don't want to be off on you know 50 feet of cable, you know 50 feet. What's that? 15 meters of cable. You don't want to be on the end of 50 meters of cable bobbing around out there in space and have to reel yourself in. And and so you just get in the habit of not being you know more than like this far away because I want to be able I want to be able to always touch structure. How does it really feel? I mean. It's, what do you see? It's probably dark. Um, it's actually, at, so if it's nighttime, it is dark. Um, so if you're on the backside of the Earth, because when we're in orbit, we're really going around the Earth. Uh -huh. And it takes us an hour and a half to go around the Earth. An hour and a half. Hour and a half. So if you start it at one side, the sun comes up, you're coming to the, the front of the Earth, and so you get about 45 minutes of sunlight, and then you're on the backside, and you don't see the sun, so it's night. And if you're working for six hours, you'll see four sunrises and four sunsets. So it's sunny. It's like sunny it's on like Earth? Sunny like, it's sunny like on Earth. And it's a really interesting thing because when, when you see the sun, it is sunny, but the sky is, if you want to call it the sky, yeah. is black. Because the only reason you see the blue sky is because the, the atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere um, filters the light and you see the blue and that's why it's blue so up there there's no atmosphere so everything's black even though there's this big white light which is the Sun when it when it comes down it's pitch dark and so you turn so your lights are on and you can see usually about you know at least a good two meters in front of you and that's you know you, that's that's all you need to see when you're doing work and uh, and then but then during the daytime you, you do see the Earth, and because we're going underneath around... Underneath your... Yeah, underneath your feet, or depend, you know, it depends what your orientation is. Um, so depending upon orientation, it might be underneath you, it might be in front of you, um, and you do see it, it's moving, because, you know, you, even though you're the one moving, it's, you know, it's like being in an airplane. Um, you know, you're moving, but you look down and the earth moves beneath you. And that can be disorienting. Um, I've heard some people say they get the feeling of falling when they see the earth. The, the earth, because, you know, you've got this big structure you're holding on here. There's nothing underneath your feet. And then you see this movement beneath you. And so they get a feeling of falling. I never had a sensation of falling. What were um, your sensations? Um, just that just wow it's it's just amazing that's the earth that I'm looking at how about your fears what was your biggest fear in the open space when you went on a spacewalk so I think my biggest fear was just um, knowing that everybody was watching you and not making a mistake how does it really feel to work in this huge costume I know that this uh, sort of a backpack just yeah. on your back, it's something like 300 pounds, but in the space, of course, you don't, you you don't do, feel you it. You don't feel it, yeah. But how does it really feel? How flexible are you? It is big and your, your hands come out like this. Um, your, your arms are, you know, they call it soft. And so you can, you, know, you can bend your arms and things like that, but from your shoulder, you are very limited as how you can move. Um, you wear these heavy gloves because you need the gloves for protection. And they have made modifications over the years to try to make the gloves as, um, so you have the dexterity in your fingers to be able to do you know, tasks. But it is hard. Recently, NASA finally provided female astronauts with more, uh, more uh, suited suits. Yeah. <laughs> they are like medium size. And, yeah. and it, it took me thinking about how how this job is just designed also for female astronauts. What were your feeling when you were getting prepared, when you were on the job? Yeah. How is it really comfortable for a female astronaut to, to do that job? Yeah, so the thing with the suit is, is that it's not, so it's not a special suit for women. It's, it, it is, so the suits come in um, three sizes, a medium, a large, and an extra large. And so, um, because we don't have as much um, resupply capability on the space station as we did when we were flying the shuttle, 
Um, they keep certain sizes on board, and so it just choose. it just happens that for the for most for most if not all the women is that you know we'll wear the medium suit because we're just smaller in stature than most men are. Yes, but there are so few female astronauts. Yeah. Why is it so? Is it because of the job, or is it because of the you know? the way females were educated, prepared, and had the opportunity yeah. to do that job. It, it, yeah, there are, fewer, there are fewer female astronauts than male astronauts because there are fewer females in the technical fields that NASA selects their astronauts from. Um, you know, so if we had more girls go into, go into engineering, um, go into astrophysics, um, you know, there, there are a lot of girls and women that, that study biology, chemistry, um, and medicine, but um, that's not 50% of the astronaut office. And so uh, most of the astronauts are engineers. What would you tell those young females, young girls who would like to become one day an astronaut? So what I, what I tell the girls that want to be an astronaut is first off, you have to find out what is your passion um, because you have to go to school and study that subject and you have to go out and get a job in that subject so that NASA sees how well you work. Um, so you have to figure out what that passion is and, um, and if you don't know what your passion is um, I will say you know look at engineering because there's a lot of engineering fields that are very very diverse. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. Mechanical engineers they do everything from you know, they design structures. They um, they'd even do some materials work of, you know, whether it's composite materials or other type of materials. Um, they do robotics. Um, that's a big field now is robotics. And so there's a lot of things you can do with, with a mechanical engineering degree. And if you get that degree and you know, you find a field that you want to be in, there's a lot of other companies out there that aren't really engineering companies, but they hire a lot of engineers because they like the way engineers think. Now, if you get an engineering degree and go work for a, for a financial, financial company, that's probably not going to get you into the astronaut corps. But if that's something you like to do, that's going to set you up for a career that's going to make you happy and you'll be successful in your lifetime.